My name is Dr. Jocelyn Sylvester, and I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist and researcher at Boston Children's Hospital in Boston. And today I want to pick up where Dr. Levwall left off, where Dr. Liu left off, and talk about some of the gaps we have and some of the things we need to know in celiac disease. So um, to start off with, I think one of the questions that we face a lot is this notion that celiac disease is a solved problem. And I think while we have tools for celiac disease, we have a treatment that's not a cure and we definitely could have more in our toolbox in order to be able to manage the condition. So I think really the paradigm has been, you have somebody who's sick with celiac disease, they have villus atrophy, you take gluten away, they feel better and their villi grow back. We're learning that it's actually more complicated than this. So I wanna take a minute and think about another autoimmune disease, type one diabetes, and what the tools are in type one diabetes and what we might have in celiac disease that's like that. So one thing about diabetes is that there's glucometers, so any patient can prick their finger and get a readout of how their blood sugar control is at that exact point in time. If there is a low reading or a high reading, there are different treatments that the patient can use in order to get that back in the target range. And there's also continuous monitors so that the patient doesn't have to be as involved in this progress and they will continually read blood glucose and signal the patient when there's a problem so that they can act. There's also pumps to deliver medication so that patients uh, can semi-automate the process. In terms of monitoring in the clinic, there's hemoglobin A1C, which is a more long-term measure of control. And then there's also uh, emerging uh, preventative therapies that might delay the onset of type 1 diabetes. So a variety of tools to manage various aspects of the diagnosis. I think in celiac disease, we would like to have more tools. Um, we have good markers for diagnosis of celiac disease on a gluten-free diet. We don't really have great tools for monitoring patients who are on treatment. And I'd argue that the gluten-free diet treatment is inadequate and not a cure. And as of yet, we don't have preventative therapy. So while we have some tools in our toolbox, there's some others on the shelf we'd like to have. So talking briefly about diagnosis, I think we've heard a little bit about this today and I'd just like to point out that we really don't have great diagnostic tests for patients who are not on a gluten-free diet. And once patients are on a gluten-free diet, putting them back on gluten in order to confirm they have celiac disease and get a diagnosis is much more complicated and very nuanced. And so really we need a better tool for patients who are already on a gluten-free diet. As well, we have TTG, which is a screening test, but we really don't understand how best to use this and which patients should be tested. We frequently see patients who feel they should have been tested earlier, and we know that there's many patients who aren't diagnosed. And so we need to figure out how to recognize the patients who need to be treated. I wanna focus mostly on treatment um, because I think most people are most concerned about the disease for the rest of their lives after their diagnosis when right now there's one treatment which is a gluten-free diet and so the paradigm as i showed before is that somebody's sick they have short villi they take gluten away or they try to take gluten away and then what happens next ideally they feel better and their villi get better but what's happening so this is actually from uh, dr dickey's thesis where uh, he reported the effect of a gluten-free diet. And I think this really encapsulates really the problems with this treatment. So this is a growth chart of height from a single patient who you can see had many admissions to hospital. And when they were admitted to hospital, they got initially diagnosed, put on a gluten-free diet and they grew. And then they went back home and they didn't grow so well, admitted, grew, flattened out. And what we're seeing here is that a gluten-free diet is easy to do in hospital but much harder, even if you're in the hospital, if you're going to school. And I think this is one of the aspects of uh, celiac disease treatment that can't be understated. Um, and thinking about children, here's some data from Canada, looking at what aspects of socializing and what feelings are evoked among children who are following a gluten-free diet. And so this treatment is not one that is benign, and it's also not one that children can necessarily hide as often they have to ask questions or their food looks different. What about adults? What, this is a study where 
patients with different conditions were contacted and asked to fill out a generic questionnaire about how burdensome their treatment is. And you can see that while well, celiac disease is not number one, it's number two. And the, treat, and the disease that was felt to be more burdensome was kidney disease, and these were patients who were on dialysis. And so definitely, while well, celiac disease and a gluten-free diet is not dialysis, the burden can be similar. Now, is it worth it? Yes, it's a lot of work, but often things are difficult. And so is there an alternative, is the treatment worth the, worth the cost? And so I think it's important to point out that in a so-called gluten-free diet, there can be gluten and even products that are labeled gluten-free can legally contain up to 20 parts per million gluten. And so one of the questions is how much gluten are our patients actually getting? So this is a study that we recently conducted where we took three people who were not, who did not have celiac disease, who are following an unrestricted diet and 18 people with celiac disease. And we collected food, stool and urine samples over a 10 day period. On the top panel, you can see the results from the control patients who are eating gluten. And you can see that there are many samples over the 10 day period that contain gluten. This is the same data. The top is the control patients again. And then the bottom is the 12 of 18 patients who had a gluten exposure. And so what you can see is all of these patients who are trying to follow a gluten-free diet, who are not eating gluten on purpose, gluten can get in from time to time in varying amounts. And one of the things we don't know is how important this is. However, um, it's probably representative when we ask patients about their gluten-free diet a large proportion will say that they have accidental gluten exposures less than once a month, suggesting that these gluten exposures are probably real. Um, and so the question is, yes, there may be some gluten. Is it gluten free enough? And what are our markers there? How is the patient feeling? Do their symptoms go away? And what happens to their villi? So this is uh, two studies looking at so-called non-responsive celiac disease, which is patients who still have symptoms on a gluten-free diet. And what's important here is that, yes, you can have celiac disease and another disease, but really one of the leading causes of symptoms is ongoing gluten exposure, which I think really speaks to how difficult it is to avoid gluten and how imperfect a gluten-free diet is as a treatment. This is a graph that's looking not at symptoms, but at if you were to go and do a repeat biopsy, how many people are gonna have villi that look normal and healthy? Because the, the thought is that if you take gluten away, the villi will grow back. What you can see, the bottom axis is age, and so, uh, and the top axis is the number of people who still have damage. And so as people are older, they tend to have more damage. And there's also, it takes more time to get better. So. Well, one third of people may have a healthy intestine after two years, two thirds would have a healthy intestine after five years. And so the length of follow-up is also important because a gluten-free diet doesn't necessarily help overnight. So what's the state of celiac disease treatment? We have a gluten-free diet, which is the current mainstay of therapy. It's socially difficult, emotionally difficult. It's not gluten-free. It doesn't resolve symptoms in everybody. It doesn't lead to mucosal recovery in everybody, and it may actually decrease health-related quality of life. So I know that we're having an excellent session coming up on treatments for celiac disease, but I want to take a moment to just ask, what would a treatment for celiac disease look like? And I think there's really sort of two broad classes. One would be something sort of like a lactase enzyme that would help patients who are trying to follow a gluten-free diet for this gluten that gets in. The other would be something that would replace a gluten-free diet, uh, some sort of immunization or injection that retrains the immune system so it doesn't attack gluten. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about what we do monitoring patients with celiac disease, because in type 1 diabetes, you can measure blood sugars, you can measure hemoglobin A1c. In celiac disease, we have a little bit of a circular problem because we ask if people are taking their treatment, we can't figure out if they've gotten their insulin prescription refilled. So we have to quiz them about what they've been eating. And depending on who's preparing the food, they might not actually know. We do have some tests to look for gluten and urine and stool, but these are expensive and you can't do them continuously. So you're really only getting a spot measurement. We also can look at immune activation, um, but these tend to go down 
when people are on a gluten-free diet, even if there's still gluten, and even if their intestine still has damage. We can do an intestinal biopsy, but people aren't necessarily signing up for that all the time. So I think in summary, we have measures of behavior and we have measures of biology. It's not necessarily clear where symptoms follow in, and ultimately we don't have great tools to really get a good handle on how patients are doing, which the patients means that patients don't also, also don't have great tools to feedback on how they're doing and if they need to adjust their gluten-free diet. So in summary, I'd argue that celiac disease is not a solved problem, but a problem to be solved, not only in terms of finding a better treatment, but also finding better tools to diagnose and monitor patients who have celiac disease.